All right, we are recording. If you are here, you can type in presence into the chat. All right, any questions before we get started? Uh, I have a question about routing tables. Cool. Um, for okay, so we, there was like tables for costs of like or cost tables um, mm -hmm. lectures, but how does that relate to the actual route? Um, and then um, for the assignment, when we put in a routing table, um, I, those are just going to be hard coded. So we basically just get to pick the route. There's not going to be any like, um, or yeah, do we just pick the route and then just send in a table that's hard coded that tells each router where to go? Or for which we, assignment? Oh, sorry. It's, uh, oh man, three. Yeah, three. You are setting the routing table. Okay. Um, and the but it's a it's a it's a different routing table. It's like a prefix routing table where you're saying for this destination use this interface. Yeah. Okay. So like each router then has knowledge about every. Actually, let me say let me say it differently. For assignment three, what you're really setting is the forwarding table. The forwarding table. Okay. Yeah, I'm calling them routing tables, but they're really forwarding tables. Whereas for this interface, you go. Sorry, for this destination, you go out this interface. Yeah. Okay. For uh, PA four, what you're what you're building from the cost table is a routing table, and then based on that, you can create a forwarding table, which is not what I'm asking you to do. You can kind of make a routing decision on the fly. Make a forwarding decision on the fly of using the routing table. Okay, so again, when we have like the cost table, or um, how does that translate into the actual route? Like, is there another table that's related that has routes, and then each one? Yeah, let me uh, see if I can clarify this. Let me find a slide for it. Um, this one, this one, okay. Um, okay, so what you're seeing here on the right is the network where each node from that knows its cost table, right? So for X, for X, the cost table would be two on this interface and seven on this interface, okay? That's the starting point for PA4. Now, when you're building the, the routing table for X, you're able to take this cost table or this cost dictionary and translate it, put it into the routing table like this. Right? So this is just what X knows. This is its cost of reaching each, each of its neighbors. Make sense to you? So far, so good? Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the cost table makes sense. I... Okay. Okay. So, so, so the cost table becomes at the beginning of the routing table, where in this, this network is simple enough that we have entries for all the destinations. But if this network was complex, and let's say there was another node here, let's call this node A, right? There would be another column for node A but X wouldn't have anything to it, right? Because it doesn't, none of its interfaces reach it. Okay, so then we go through the process of building the routing tables by nodes exchanging the, its, uh, their routing tables with each other. Okay, and 
And then we end up with this. So let's say that uh, X wants to route to Z. Okay. So from this routing table, it's X says, okay, how can I get to Z? Um, I know that Y has a route to Z at the cost of one. I don't know how Y is gonna reach Z. That's not my problem. I just know that Y told me that it can reach Z up. It, that it can reach Z at the cost Y, okay? And I know that um, I can, uh, that Z can reach itself, okay? So that's not very helpful, um, right? So I can really just forward either to Z directly, okay? Or I can forward to, um, to Y. So my cost of reaching Y, is going to be two, okay? And my cost, and the cost from Y to Z is going to be one. And so that's my cost of three. Okay, yeah. Okay. That makes Whereas sense. if you look in the cost table of X reaching Z directly, it would be seven. So that's not a good solution. Right, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so each node like has knowledge of everyone else's cost and then mm -hmm. just, Use it out okay, yep. that makes a lot more sense. Yep, so when you have a destination, I guess you have, you have kind of two choices. You can either reach it directly, and then you can look into your cost table, right, which may get overwritten here, right? This is the original cost to Z from X. Okay, but you can always check against the cost table directly if you have a direct link, or you can go through all your neighbors, right, and uh, see what is the shortest path. Okay. Through, through each so of your neighbors. In this final column of tables, um, node X doesn't even know about its direct link, right? Like it just, it, if it goes, wants to go to Z, it just um, knows its cost is three. Like where's the reference? from X straight to Z. It still has the cost table, right? So it's a original cost table or it's that? a original cost vector, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Anybody else? So with that, uh, we move on to Ethernet and virtual LANs, the topic for today. Okay, so uh, Ethernet is uh, the dominant wired LAN technology. Um, the kind of idea is that Ethernet started back in the day and it has gone through a lot of evolution since then. And basically, even though there were changes to the protocol, it's still called uh, Ethernet and it will probably be called Ethernet forever and ever. Um, so it's sort of a, tr a historical transition, even though there have been a lot of changes, the name has not changed. Okay. So um, initially, there were other LAN technologies or local area network technologies. Um, those were the token ring and um, asynchronous transfer mode networks that came out of uh, uh, the phone network, but LAN proved cheaper um, and eventually it's LAN was cheaper and eventually its performance improved enough that um, the other approaches did not make sense. And so it had it was able to keep up with the speed race with the other technologies. Um, and uh, the protocol is simple which means that the hardware implementing the protocol can be simple, which means it's cheaper to manufacture. And so that's kind of where the cost comes in. So this is the original, uh, one of the original drawings of ethernet. And th the idea was that there was a wire that um, moved through the building or through an office uh, called the ether. And then different computers were able to tap into it 
Um, and the ether effectively became a broadcast domain when such that whenever one computer sent a message, it was delivered to all the other message to all the other um, computers. Sort of like a you can think of it as a bus, right? And so there was this tap. I'll show you guys what it looked like in a second, where you could sort of tap into this ether cable at any point along the way, right? And so if you ever had a, a problem with this network, right? If some computers got disconnected, you had to kind of check where the the break in the ether was. Um, oh. I thought I had a cool image. Anyway, uh, maybe it's later, later on in the slides. Um, so anyway, uh, so you basically have to walk the line to kind of find out where, where the break was and where the computers got disconnected. So the way Ethernet is organized in terms of the network stack is we have here the network stack on the left. And the link layer implements the MAC protocol and frame format of Ethernet. And then the same frame is used or passed onto the onto the physical layer to actually transmit the bits of the data. And now depending which Ethernet technology you're using, there might be those bits might be enco encoded differently on the wire. So you have different technologies for uh, sending data over twisted pair of copper. You have different Ethernet technologies for sending data over uh, fiber. Um, and so these are differences at the physical layer, basically how bits are encoded, but all these things transmit the Ethernet frame whose format does not change. Um, this is convenient because I'll show you guys, so you can connect these different physical layer technologies and, and basically pass the same frame between them without sort of translating it to a different format. Right? So it allows you to kind of have one Ethernet network that spans different physical layer technologies that might work better in terms of range, speed, um, amount of traffic it, um, uh, that a link has to carry. Okay, so this is the vampire tap that I mentioned before. You have a single line, which might run through an office, and then there is like an inner cable and an outer cable, and so what you would do is you would kind of crimp this thing at any point and penetrate the shielding to kind of get to the inner layers to get the transmission. So it's got a cute name of vampire tap, but this wasn't terribly reliable. Um, and you had to, that's my animation. Yeah, you had to walk the line to find where the break was. So um, to avoid this situation, um, the next kind of approach was to build sort of an interface to this cable that was a little bit more reliable, and then eventually uh, we moved on to the Ethernet jack that you guys know today. Right? So these are the different physical layer technologies, but the protocol was the same. And so when it comes to the, the frames that are transmitted, we have the standard frame of 1500 bytes, but um, there are also formats for jumbo frames when you want to transmit more data, we have the same header, but you can allow for more data to be transmitted inside each frame. You can make, can then allow for your IP packets to be larger, but maybe then they are too large to go outside of your network, and then they need to be fragmented onto the standard frame size, which is part of your uh, PA to be assigned. Okay, there are different variants for Ethernet: uh, 10 base T, 100 base T. They basically dif differ by the number of uh, volt uh, voltages that carry. Uh, the symbols, okay, so more voltages, meaning that you can have more complicated symbols that carry more bits. And then you have standard for, standards for optical fiber, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And then when you have a bridge um, that kind of links two different cables together, you can think of it as a hub or, or a bridge, we'll kind of get into the differences between those. Um, the same frame might be translated onto a different physical layer technology. Okay. So fiber optics yeah. is also considered Ethernet then? It can be. Oh. It can be. You can send Ethernet frames over fiber optics, but there are also other fiber optics protocols that have different uh, MAC layer frames. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
so what does this bag look like? It's really simple. Um, you have a preamble, which has um, seven bytes with this pattern, followed by one byte with this pattern. And so basically sending one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and eventually this ends with one, one. The reason that is there is if you have um, different network cards connected together over a wire, they need to be able to synchronize their clocks to be able to say, okay, this very short period of time, whatever voltage is in here, we're going to count that as one bit, and then the voltage should change, and then we can count that as another, as, as another bit. Okay? So when these clocks synchronize, after the synchronization, um, the clocks need to stay synchronized long enough for to receive the rest of the frame, but basically they can say, okay, uh, from here, from this time to this time, this is the first bit. From here to here is another bit, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is especially important if you're using different speeds for transmission um, or different. Or I guess you can also use this to synchronize the speeds at which bytes are being transmitted if you're using different Ethernet technologies. Um, Okay, so we have the preamble, which allows for clock synchronization. Then we have the destination address. This is the MAC address. Then we have the source address. Okay, um, why would the destination address be first? Anybody? Okay, so as someone is receiving this, right, they synchronize the clocks, they can figure out the destination address, and now they can say, oh, okay, I need to forward this packet or this frame out a particular interface, and I can start moving data in that direction. Okay? So it allows you to make a forwarding decision earlier um, instead of waiting for, you know, reading source address, if this were reversed, and then just to wait for the destination address to make a forwarding decision. Okay, so we have the addresses, then we have the type, just two bytes, which specifies the higher layer protocol to handle the payload. And we've seen this before, so maybe this would be um, the IP protocol if we're including an IP packet in here. Okay. Then we have uh, the data, which is the upper layer uh, protocol packet, and then the CRC to make sure that uh, there were no errors on the wire in this transmission. Questions? Okay. All right. So, Ethernet can be established in different topologies. Um, let's say through mid 1990s, um, nodes were connected to a bus. This is the vampire tab idea. Okay. Um, there's a shared coaxial cable which anybody can tap into, and this is all one broadcast domain. Okay. Now, the problem with this is that as the length of this cable increased, right, if you had a bigger office or multiple floors in an office, um, all these computers shared a single broadcast domain, which means that their packets could collide. And we have the C uh, CSMA uh, CD protocol, the collision detection protocol which means that if there is a collision, nodes can stop transmitting early and then we try. But if you have many nodes, collisions are still likely and the length of the wire increases. And we've seen before that as uh, kind of the propagation time increases, the efficiency of this network decreases. And so um, this doesn't really scale very well. So what people move to is a star topology, or kind of a tree topology, when we expand it to multiple switches, where we're putting a hub or a switch in the center. Okay. You can still think of this as a broadcast channel if this is a hub. What the hub will do is basically get a packet and then, or get a frame, and then retransmit it on all the links. Okay. So it doesn't really solve the collision domain problem but it can boost the signal so you can reach those computers. You can place them further out. Or if you do a, if, if this is not a hub by a switch, the switch can choose to, instead of forwarding the packet on all the links, it can decide to forward it on one of the links, therefore not uh, creating collisions for these other nodes. 
would bus just normally be faster because you don't have that extra step in between then or i mean would it be i guess trivial um it would be cheaper and it could potentially be faster with few nodes with fewer nodes Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, I guess, yeah, of scaling, yeah. Yeah, because on a hub, you still need to receive the packet before you do something with it, right? It's still storing forward. Whereas, you know, here, if this computer is transmitting, this computer will start receiving bits while the frame is still being trans transmitted. Would you also have, like, with that kind of switch, um, would, I mean, you might even run in, like, segmentation and stuff like that uh, that you wouldn't have with a shared or... Am I overthinking that? Um, you probably wouldn't run into would you run into segmentation issues. You can, but those would be treated at the IP layer. So um, yes, yes, with the with the bus, you would not run into segmentation issues because you're just transmitting one packet, right? Whereas here, you could transmit a jumbo frame that then maybe wouldn't be transmittable to this network card, which can only handle, which cannot handle jumbo frames. Um, okay, so we have hubs and we have switches. Um, so as I mentioned, a hub will basically rebroadcast an arriving packet on one interface onto all the other interfaces, okay? Um, so it is not stored forward, meaning that you know multiple people can be transmitting at the same time. Okay, um, and so if there's a simultaneous transmission from this node and this node, the bits will collide in this uh, in this hub. It's not like the hub is going to store one packet, the other packet, one frame, the other frame, and then retransmit them. Okay, but the hub can boost a signal, which allows you to place these nodes further out. Okay. On a switch, which is what's really used today, even though sometimes colloquially they'll still they will still be called hubs, you have different interfaces, and each interface will store the arriving frame. And so all these nodes can be transmitting data at the same time. The switch will store all the packets and then figure out which on which interfaces it should forward them and transmit them simultaneously on different interfaces. So maybe one packet will go here and another packet would go on that interface. So it acts more like a, more like a router. Okay? You're not going to have collisions. It's full duplex, meaning it can be you know, transmitting data here and receiving data here on different interfaces, okay? um, or even on the same interface, even though it is duplex um, in this. Um, da, 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 da. You can have different speeds connected to which to which uh, to each link, and the nice thing is that this is transparent to users. The users can't really, um, I mean, the, the, there's no difference from the transmission perspective as to which in, which type of uh, network hardware you're using in the middle. Uh, okay. Strange example. Yeah. I don't know if you were familiar with back in the day when Xbox and you do LAN parties and stuff like that, where you'd all link up through a hub, or we always called it a hub. Um, yeah. Was that in fact a hub, or would that be a switch in that case? Um, I don't know. It's transparent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Just kind of curious. Uh, yeah. It, so, was when you had a lot of traffic, was it blinking extra hard? Uh, I remember that thing getting pretty hot at one point. <laughs> but was it blinking? I mean, there were lots of lights on it. <laughs> this is a long time ago. I, 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 yeah. Okay. So on hubs, you would have, uh, you can kind of see it here. See, there's a power, there's a power light mm -hmm. and there's a collision light. See, there's like two lights here. Oh, sure. On the switch, there's only one light just for power. Huh. Maybe I'll have okay. to take it out and see. <laughs> so what would happen is if there were people transmitting and there was a collision, this light would light up. It would it would like blink. So you okay. could see, you could kind of look at a switch and see, you know, the intensity of traffic based on the kind of frequency of collisions. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad these uh I was able to see these two lights on this. <laughs> cool. Um <laughs> Okay. Um, 
Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, uh, okay, so we can basically, so through a switch with six interfaces, we can have simultaneous conversations uh, between A and A prime and B and B prime uh, without collisions. Okay, um, but how does the switch know where to forward the data, right? The hub will simply rebroadcast the data and thereby reach everybody. But the switch needs to know that um, that A prime is reachable through interface four, okay? And whatever B prime through interface five. So there has to be some um, discovery process for which interface to forward. Uh, sorry, there was a chat. I missed it. There wasn't anything important. Okay. Cool. Okay, so basically what the switch builds up is a switching table. Um, not a routing table, but a switching table, but it really looks the same. There is a difference we'll get into a little bit later. Okay, so it really looks like a routing table. We have the MAC address of host, the interface over which to reach that host, and the time to live for this entry before expired or needs to be refreshed. Okay, so um, the difference is that instead of an IP address in here or an IP prefix, we would have a specific MAC address. Right? So there's no aggregation of these entries like you would see on a router. Um, each entry would have, or each destination would have its own entry in this table. That's kind of one difference. Okay. So when are these entries created? In a routing protocol, if this were a router, there would be some routing protocol involved where there will be a broadcast trying to find destinations that are connected. There will be some reachability packets that are being sent back and forth. Okay. We don't have this type of protocol for switching. And so these entries are basically built up by the switch observing the traffic going through it. Okay. Let's look at an example. So what we have is a packet going from A to A prime. I know I have the field switched here. Um, Let's just deal with that. So it's a packet from A to A prime, or the destination is the second field. OK, so what happens? So it sends this frame, which arrives at the switch. The switch says, oh, OK, cool. Looks like packets from uh, MAC address A are arriving to me through interface 1. OK, great. So now I know that if I want to send something to A, that needs to go through interface 1. And I can put a time to live on it of 60 seconds. Okay. At this point, the switch has no idea where to forward this packet, where to forward this frame, excuse me. And so it's going to broadcast it to everybody else. Okay. And so when it broadcasts it to everybody else, A prime also receives a copy. At this point, A prime can send a reply. And now the switch says, oh, okay, cool. Looks like a prime is reachable through interface four. When A sends the next frame, that frame will arrive. I'm going to have the, not have an animation for that. When A sends the next frame, it arrives at the switch, and the switch can look at, oh, this is for A prime. Now the switch can look at its table and say, cool, A prime is reachable through interface four. So I'm going to forward it through interface four and not broadcast it to everybody else. Sweet. Okay, so let's look at this protocol in more detail. So when the switch receives a frame, okay, if the destination MAC address is not found in this table, um, it is going to flood or basically rebroadcast the frame on all its links. Great. Okay. If the destination is on the interface from which the frame arrived, the frame will be dropped. Otherwise, the frame will be forwarded on the interface from the table. Why do we have this part here as part of this protocol? Okay, so a frame arrives from A to the switch, and then the switch can decide that the, if the destination is on this interface, okay, it would drop the frame. But why would the switch be getting this frame in the first place? 
It's a little counterintuitive. Let's say that there is a hub connected to the switch. Okay, so if there's a communication between two nodes, one here and one here, and they're sending data to each other via a hub, okay, anytime there's a transmission between these two nodes, a copy of the data is being broadcast and also arriving at the switch. But the switch knows that the destination is behind this interface as well, and so it doesn't need to rebroadcast or forward it to anybody else. And so the switch allows the termination of a broadcast domain of potentially a hub connected to it. Um, okay. So, Questions? Sorry, I was trying to get my mic unmuted. So that, is that essentially just like duplication prevention? Like it's not going to send duplicate messages or uh, packets? Is, is that your thing? Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me actually draw this. I think I need a picture. For this. Okay. So let's say uh, let's say we don't have that. Okay. Let's say there's a hub here. Okay. Hub. Cool. Okay. And then we have two links to it. We have traffic to X and going to X prime. Okay. So when X sends a message to X prime, okay, there's a frame going to the hub, mm -hmm. okay, and the hub retransmits that frame to everybody. That's what the hub does. Right. right. Okay. That makes so, sense. So, yep. So that that frame goes to X prime, and that frame also goes to the switch. The switch says, "Okay, looks like X is on interface six. That's what gets entered into this table. Okay. And then uh, the switch rebroadcasts the frame to everybody else because uh, the Mac was not in the table yet. Okay. Then X prime replies. Okay. The frame goes to the hub, the hub retransmits it to everybody else. The switch says, oh, cool. Okay. It looks like X prime is behind interface six. But since this is the first frame, it also rebroadcasts that frame to everybody else. Okay. Now X sends a reply to X prime. Okay. That frame goes to the hub. The hub rebroadcasts it. But now the switch says, oh, this message is for X prime. And I already know that X prime is on interface six. So the frame is arriving such that the destination is on the interface from which the frame arrived. And so now the switch drops this frame. It doesn't rebroadcast it to everybody else. But the hub does, and so the frame still reaches X prime. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you for clearing that. Cool. cool. Thanks. I'll uh, add this picture for next year. <laughs> um, sweet. Okay, so that's that's how this works. Okay. So now what we can do is we can connect a bunch of switches together to build a bigger network. Okay. So if we want to send data from a frame from A to G, okay, how does S1 know to forward the frame uh, via S4 and S3? Is that again going to have to do with how the packet header has like destination and stuff like that in it, and the the interfaces will have routing tables? The interfaces will have switching tables, but yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. So we have a packet, we have a frame arriving from A. Okay. And that frame is going to be initially rebroadcast in all the different on all the different interfaces. Okay. It gets broadcast here, it gets rebroadcast here, and here, and on all the different links. Okay. Now uh, switch one knows that. A is on this interface, okay? Now the frame is rebroadcast, and so switch four learns that A is reachable through this interface, okay? Um, and then arriving at switch three, it also knows that A is reachable on this interface, okay? Now, G sends a reply, okay? And so, Switch three knows that 
G is available here, okay? That all gets also, actually, let me switch colors. Otherwise, we'll never get track of it. Okay. Um, Okay, so G sends a reply, okay? That reply is now to A, okay? When this gets to switch three, switch three says, oh, I already know where A is. I don't need to rebroadcast this, okay? So it simply forwards the packet, the frame in this direction. Switch four says, oh, cool, this is for A. I'm gonna forward in this direction and then switch one does the same thing, okay? In the meantime, Switch three recognizes that G is reachable through here. And switch four recognizes that G is reachable through here. And G is reachable through here. So now when A replies, it just the packet just gets unicast to G. Okay. So this kind of broadcasting or route discovery is called self-learning, that in that the switching tables are established as a result of traffic being uh, forwarded. So if I'm thinking of this correctly, if E was to send a message um, through switch two, switch four would already know where G was if E was sending to G, so it wouldn't need to broadcast it to towards switch one. Um, yes. If, if so, that makes sense. Like, say E wanted to send a message to G. Okay. And it would so send here's it what happens. So there's a message to G. What yeah. does switch two do? It's going to broadcast it to everybody on switch two. Yep. Right. And then it's also going to broadcast it to switch four. But if I'm thinking correctly, then switch four will already know where G is. So it just immediately forwards Very it good. down, right? It, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't send it towards the left, towards switch one, right? Yes, exactly right. Okay. So essentially, all it needs is a little bit of traffic to come from every computer in order for it to learn its destinations, which is the self learning portion of this uh exactly exactly okay. now okay. keep in mind that those entries expire after 60 right. seconds or whatever you set it to so um if there's no traffic eventually the switches will forget cool thanks cool yep okay why don't we do this in the internet for routing I mean, it feels like if you're broadcasting absolutely every single time, that's going to be a lot of traffic that's going to exactly. be unnecessary. Exactly. Exactly. So um, this doesn't really work in very, very big networks, right? Because you have to broadcast packets to everybody. Um, there's also another issue in this, in that switches only work on in trees. There is no concept of like an alternative path. That's right. So you only have this will only work in a tree in a tree topology, right? There's no there's no concept of a routing cost. Okay. So but for small topologies, this works very well. Okay. So let's look at a bigger network and see how it might be organized. We can have that's my laser. Okay. We can have a number of switches that are connected together in a tree. Maybe each switch corresponds to a building, such as EE building, a computer science building, whatever. To that switch, maybe these are hubs, maybe these are switches. Um, you can have the web server, the mail server connected, right, in their own kind of networks. And then eventually you would have a router that would connect you to uh, the broader internet. Okay? And what you might see here is that there are 100 megabits per second links. Um, between the different buildings and maybe a, a more capable link to the router because it has to carry the traffic from the whole organization. Okay? And then maybe each of the computers would be connected over less beefy in, uh, Ethernet to uh, the department switch. Okay? So this has to do with provisioning the network, getting the fitness right uh, so that none of these links become a bottleneck. OK, so let's do a quick comparison. Since we, since we have both switches and routers in this, in this network, let's do a quick comparison. So we can forward a data, a data, uh, an application layer packet. Let's call it that way, application layer message, 
through switches and routers in the same network. Okay, so what happens? Forward it from the application layer to the transport layer, uh, create a segment, which then goes to the network layer to create a packet. The packet then goes inside a frame at the link layer, and then gets transmitted over the physical layer. Okay. It gets to the switch. The switch receives the bytes from the physical layer, passes the frame to the link layer, and then based on the self-learning process, it decides which interface to forward that packet on, the frame on, or to broadcast it. Okay. The frame then arrives at a router. Okay, this is a router symbol because it's a circle. Um, or it has kind of I don't know, a slightly different symbol here, but usually circles mean uh, routers. Okay. And so the frame is decoded, goes to the link layer, but now the frame is not switched because the router says basically gets the link layer to forward the frame up to the network layer where a routing decision or a forwarding decision is made to forward that packet onto through an interface, which then delivers it to ultimately its destination, and the packet is forwarded through all the layers back to the application. Okay. So, so a piece of data transmitting, trans, being transferred by a switch will be processed by the link layer, or if it's a router from the link layer, will forward data to the network layer to make a routing decision. Okay. So we can compare these in terms of things like path reliability, forwarding speed, and network scalability. Okay. Um, in terms of path reliability, switches only allow for one path in the network. If you want to have two paths be available or have a fallback path or have load balancing, um, you need to have routers, right? Switches won't be able to, to handle that. Um, as far as forwarding speed, which one would be faster, a switch or a router? Switch. Why? Because it only has one, one path to take or one direction to go, I guess. Okay, so the decision is simpler. Maybe. It also takes less, less processing, right? You don't have to forward the packet to another layer for a decision. Yeah? So switching is going to be faster. And as far as network scalability, obviously routing wins because you don't need to broadcast uh, your data packets to the entire network. Okay. So with that, um, we can look at how to actually translate a network that logically looks like this into something that we can actually lay out through um, a building or through a physical deployment. And this is where um, virtual lands will come in handy. Okay, so um, first question with a physical LAN, which is what we've been talking about, is um, does, let's say, packet from the computer science department need to be broadcast to the entire network? Right, if these are all switches, initially a packet from computer science would go to all the different switches. Right? That seems wasteful. Somehow we should maybe try to constrain it a little bit. Okay. Um, if there are many small groups, right, many small departments, or maybe each each lab wants to have its own broadcast domain, then the network becomes complicated with many small small switches. That gets expensive, hard to manage. Okay. Um, and then what happens when a user moves between groups? Right. Logically, maybe we want that host to be part of the computer science broadcast domain, but now they're in a different building, right? It's, do we run a separate wire to follow that person around campus? Probably we don't want to do that, okay? So this is where virtual LANs come in handy. What we can have is a switch, okay, that logically separates groups of ports as belonging to a different virtual LAN. Okay, so, for example, computer science ports would be whatever, 9 to 15. And so a message sent to port 9 would be broadcast through all the other ports belonging to computer science, but not to the ports belonging to electrical engineering. Right? You can think of it as two switches glued together, but we can logically assign ports to the one virtual LAN uh, or another. Okay? Um, so this begs a question of how to send data between uh, EE and CS. 
And two approaches are possible. One, we have a separate router where data from here needs to be, if it's not going to electrical engineering, it needs to be sent to a router, which then routes it back to the switch, which then forwards the data to computer science. It's one possibility. The other one is to have a built-in router inside the switch just for this purpose. Okay, so if the data is not destined for anybody here, right, if it's basically for uh, a, uh, a gateway from the point of view of electrical engineering, that gateway would also be physically located on the same hardware and then routed onto uh, to computer science. And so you have a piece of networking hardware which does switching really quickly, but can also do routing between the connected sort of virtual switches. Okay. Now, what if we have the organization that is spread between multiple buildings? Right. Well, we can kind of run a uh, cable between ports for the same organization between different VLAN ports. Uh, in the different buildings, but now that means we need a cable kind of per organization. Uh, this is maybe too physical of a solution where we want it to be a little bit more flexible logically. And so what can be run between two different switches is a trunk line that can carry the traffic for both computer science and electrical engineering between buildings. Right? And so um, the question is how to direct a frame that has been sent onto a trunk line to different domains. So the way this happens is if we look at a normal Ethernet frame, we have the preamble destination source, the type of the upper layer protocol data and the CRC. When we put this data through the trunk line, we're going to add two different fields, uh, the protocol identifier and the tag control information. Okay. So the protocol identifier basically says, don't pass this frame to IP, pass it back to Ethernet, okay? And the tag control information says, pass it to computer science or EE, okay? So when this, when this frame is being sent to the trunk line, it gets these two extra fields. When this, when this frame is received on the trunk line, uh, it doesn't get forwarded to IP, it gets forwarded to Ethernet, and then Ethernet can look at the tag control information and say, oh, okay, cool, this frame is for computer science. Okay. You can say, all right, this is kind of a silly thing, why talk about departments, who does this, why do we need the same broadcast domain between, uh, you know, computers belonging to different faculty of, or students, right? So this is true. But if you're running, let's say, a data center that's split between buildings, right, this becomes a lot more simple. Because now broadcasting is broadcasting or packets is actually more useful inside data centers. When talking about things like MapReduce or um, other types of computing protocols. Right? And so now it makes sense to maybe have one cluster that's kind of physically split between buildings or between floors but logically within the same domain. Okay. And you can define these virtual lands in different ways, okay? You can define it based on ports where certain ports belong to one organization or another. You can say, okay, forget about splitting these ports. We're gonna create a groups of MAC addresses and say this MAC address belongs to a double E and this MAC address belongs to CS. So there's kind of a list of MAC addresses being configured and held here. Okay. Or you can do it based on uh, network protocols. Maybe IPv4 belongs to one um, uh, VLAN and IPv6 belongs to another VLAN. And so that way you can have kind of two different types of clusters sharing Ethernet infrastructure while thinking that they're entirely separate from each other. All right, questions, because this ends my presentation for today. So you could basically use this to like selectively um, neglect or, or not um, pass data through certain areas, I guess. Would this be also used for kind of like security? Um, like if you're doing like top secret research in the same lab as 
you know, maybe down the hallway they're not kind of a thing? You could, you could. We'll talk about how similar things get done with, with MPLS, but I'll give you a very practical example. Let's say you're having a LAN party with two different teams, right? And these are two teams of computer science students that took networking and know how to sniff packets using Wireshark. Okay, based on sniffing packets of the opposing team, you can figure out maybe what they're doing. Uh, you have an advantage because you can kind of analyze their traffic and see where they are in the game. If you can decrypt it, which maybe you can. Okay, but if you set up a VLAN, the traffic from one team will simply not be visible or sniffable by the other team. I mean, okay. it doesn't get any more practical than that. I don't know what to tell you. That, does, that, that makes sense, right? So it's like a security thing. Yeah, for, yeah. You know, <laughs> no, that's a good way to think of it. Um, anything else? All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually on time. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.